name's Ben Smith, and I'm a developer advocate for AWS, that's Amazon Web Services, and I specialize specifically in building serverless-based applications. So this talk is about building applications using a workflow service called AWS Step Functions. Now, I am going to talk about the service. I know sometimes in developer conferences, people don't like you talking about vendor-specific services and features, but I'll give you a warning now. I am going to go into some depth about it. But I'm going to also be showing you some patterns that you can pick out on how to build common kind of architectural patterns as a workflow. And you can pick that out and kind of drop that into other tools that help you build as workflow. So I hope if you're, if you're not an AWS user, then you can still use some of the ideas here. Just to get an idea, actually, who's already building applications or got some kind of workload running in some sort of uh, cloud-based environment? Can you give me a rough idea? OK, so about 2 thirds of the room. Is anyone already using serverless in some form? Same people. OK, thank you. So my name's Ben Smith, as I said. And um, before joining AWS, I was actually a web developer, a PHP developer, for about 15 years, specializing in uh, workflow automation. Um, before doing tech, I was actually a ski instructor. And I once had the pleasure of even teaching David Hasselhoff how to ski. So anyone over the age of about 37, maybe you heard of David Hasselhoff. Great actor, not such a great skier, but he was fun. Um, so I'm not going to be showing you loads of links and loads of QR codes. That's interesting. That keeps popping up. I'm not going to be showing you loads of QR codes throughout this talk or lots of links. I'm going to show this one now and again at the very end. But this is a landing page that kind of um, aggregates everything I'm going to be talking about. So you have here lots of downloadable and deployable infrastructure as code templates, uh, lots of blog posts that go into detail about some of the features I'll be talking about, um, videos, some really good in-depth workshops that take a few hours to complete, let you get hands on, um, and literally hundreds of code samples that you can use to kind of help debug with applications that you're currently building. And as I say, I'll show that again at the very end. So since joining AWS about four years ago, I've spent most of my time, there's that lovely pop-up again. This is, gonna, this is gonna be a good game, isn't it? I've spent most of my time building applications using this service called Step Functions, using workflows. And when you start building a lot of things using workflows, you tend to start thinking of everything as a, a workflow or a decision tree. And I'm even doing my kind of uh, agendas as workflow now. So this is what I'll be covering. I'll be talking about why I believe Step Functions is a great choice for your next serverless-based application. We're we'll talking about the different modes you can run your Step Functions workflows in as a standard or express, and about the cost implementations and um, why you would and how you would save costs uh, running it in those two different modes. I'll be talking about a lot of different patterns that you can apply throughout the whole talk. Things for stuff like handling errors and running applications at huge scale. And this is what I hope you take away from this, right? I hope you get some inspiration for ideas that help you deliver more value for your customers to build applications that are reliable, resilient to faults and failures, super scalable, super easy to build, and to build as quickly as possible. And actually, I hope every talk you've been to here today is in service to at least some of these goals. So this is how I think of the kind of serverless event-driven model, right? The serverless spectrum. Everything is serverless in the cloud these days, or so it seems. I wonder how I can get rid of that earth update. Everything is serverless in the cloud these days, right? And every time a new feature comes out, it's always announced as serverless. It tends to get quite confusing, really. The way I think of serverless is this, right? If you think of it as a kind of pyramid or a spectrum where you're building services or you're building applications by leaning into this service-driven approach, and each of, these each of these services kind of sits on a pyramid from manual to managed. So as you move along the spectrum, these services become more and more managed or more and more serverless. And you're using these services for the individual thing for which they're designed. And when you're building applications in this way, you're normally going to use more than one service, right? You're not just going to have a whole application running on a Lambda function or running uh, on EventBridge. You're going to want to combine them together. 
So the, the new challenge that arises is when you have these applications that are spread over multiple different services, sometimes in different regions and different accounts, is how do you understand how those applications are linked together, right? How do you uh, keep them decoupled but know how to inspect the kind of passing of data from one service to another? And this is where Step Functions comes in, right? So Step Functions is an AWS service that lets you orchestrate all the other services into workflows. This really is going to be a uh, game throughout the talk, isn't it? Um, it lets you orchestrate all the other services as workflows. Now, here's a little animation of me building out a workflow in something called Workflow Studio, which is in the AWS console. And I'm able to select from a bunch of actions on the left, things like saving something to a database or invoking a Lambda function. Um, I'm also able to uh, drag that into a kind of design view, and I can arrange that around conditional logic with if statements, loops. I can run dynamic parallel states at the same time. And then I can drill down into any one of those actions and configure it with the editable form on the right. I can also export that workflow as code, right? It's called ASL, Amazon States Language, and I can commit that to my Git repository, and I can share that with my development team. We can make pull requests to it, and we can add it to our infrastructure as code templates. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If I take that out, and I just stand here, here we go. This will solve it. So I can add that to my infrastructure as code templates, and I can start building out my applications in a more scalable way with my other development team. Now, step functions are pay per use. So the payment model scales in line with the number of requests that you send to your workflow. Okay? If you're using it more, you pay more. If you're using it less, you pay less. If you're not using it at all, you pay nothing. That's the whole kind of concept of serverless where you can scale back down to zero. And this scaling happens automatically, right? It's fully managed. So there's nothing to provision, there's nothing to patch or anything like that. It has this neat drag and drop interface, or you can export and build as code. And it's superb for handling errors. OK, so I'll show you some patterns for handling errors with workflows in a moment. But the kind of magic piece with Step Functions is that it integrates natively with over 220 other AWS services. And the way it does that is by calling that service's SDK directly. So it doesn't spin up some sort of Lambda function under the hood and invoke their SDK. The service itself actually calls that SDK action, whether that's putting something onto a database or invoking a Lambda function. So this is why I think workflows are something you should, uh, you should use as soon as you start building your next serverless application. And I want to explain why I say that. Right. Here's the sort of most common uh, hurdle that we see customers moving or hitting against every time they start building a serverless application using Lambda. This is the most common story I've seen after speaking to many, many customers. Let's say it's day one, and I want to take advantage of this new serverless thing, and I've been told by some manager to go and run something in Lambda. So I'm just going to figure it out, and I'm going to get something from a DynamoDB database. So the first thing I need to do is choose which runtime I'm going to build my Lambda function in. I'm going to choose Node. Then I'm going to bring in the SDK for Node. And then I'm going to bring in the library for DynamoDB. It's called dot .client, and it lets me kind of marshal and unmarshal data with DynamoDB. Then I set up my params object. So I have things like the name of the database, the partition key, and the sort key. Then I set up my function to query the items. So here, I'm going to use that dot .client put the params object in, I'm going to promiseify the call, I put that in a try-catch block, and then I'm going to learn all about what the Lambda export handler is, what the event, hand or the event object is, what the context object is, what this event-driven model actually means. Once I've learned that, with the fantastic AWS docs, I'm going to put that inside a try-catch statement, and I'm going to um, make a synchronous call to that query items, and I'm going to stringify the response, and I'm going to return any errors. That's 20 lines of code just to get something from a DynamoDB table where I already knew the key. It's not very easy. This is one of our Hello World kind of setups on, um, on the docs. Regardless of the fact that it doesn't actually do a Hello World, I think it's quite a complicated getting started use case. Right? I've got 20 lines of code here and a lot of learning before I can do anything uh, just to get something from a DynamoDB table. I can achieve exactly the same thing using a workflow, and it would look like this. I'd simply use the getItem SDK in my step functions workflow. 
I can still retry for anything that fails. I can still send failures downstream to a dead letter queue to process later on. And this is not just like a pretty picture in a PowerPoint diagram. This is actually how it looks in the service, right? I can see all the different services involved, and I can understand exactly what this application does. So if I come back to this in a month or a week or either later on in the day, I have these two versions, and which one is going to be easier for me to reason about, understand, pick up, and extend? Then I start sending executions to my workflow. Now, with step functions, I have this kind of single pane of glass to see all the failed and all the successful executions in one place. I can drill down into any one of those executions, and I can see what the input looked like, what the failure looked like, what the output looked like. I can even step through each individual state and understand what the input to that step was and what the output was. These are things that are really difficult to do with a serverless application that's spread over multiple different resources where you're chasing around various logs. But because you're orchestrating it all together in a step functions workflow, all of that information is handled and presented to you by the step functions console. OK, let's go back to my Lambda example. Let's say I built it in Lambda in day one, and I figured all that stuff out. And now I'm at day 100, and I have this little microservice that's running, and it's uh, servicing requests. It's grabbing items from DynamoDB. I'm getting a lot of traffic. It's scaling automatically. I'm pretty happy with it. And now I need this little tiny microservice to do more things. I need it to create things in DynamoDB. I need it to update and delete. So. I put it behind a URL, and I use API Gateway, which is another AWS service, to create a URL to access your Lambda function. So I put it behind this URL. I send all valid requests downstream to my Lambda function. Then in my Lambda function, I have some extra code that routes each request to the valid bit of code, right? whether it's a create, an update, or a delete. Probably I'm going to look at the shape of that inbound HTTP request and know which bit of code I need to run. OK, this is working, right? Because it's still serverless. It's still scaling automatically. So I'm happy with this at first. But this is the problem, right? There's a few things here, actually. The first is that in order to build something like this, I need to configure security permissions to my Lambda function. So I need a Lambda function, in this case, who is allowed to create, update, and delete items in DynamoDB. It's quite a loosely permissed function. I also need to configure the memory allocation to this function, which could be different depending on which one of these actions it needs to perform. And I need to configure things like the timeout limit, which again would be different depending on which one of those actions. So this is what most people at AWS or most experts of uh, Lambda will tell you to do, right? They'll tell you to split this function out into three separate functions, one for each one of those actions, one thing to create, one to update, one to delete move that routing logic to the configuration of API Gateway. So I've cut out a whole bunch of code there, and I've set that code as config on the API Gateway service. This is better, because now I can configure each one of these functions with the security and the memory and the timeout to be more specific to that actual function, to what it needs. But now I've got three resources instead of one. I've got 60 lines of code instead of 20, and my application becomes more and more difficult to kind of understand, reason about, picture how it's put together. There's no kind of diagram that exists like this in the service, right? So you just have to draw this externally or, or kind of keep an idea of it in your head. This becomes a problem. People tell us that they don't know how to keep track of their application when it starts spreading out like this. And this is just three Lambda functions. Also, what I have here, because it's 60 lines of code, it's 60 places where there's something that can go wrong because it's my code. It's the most likely place for something to go wrong. This is the first pattern that I want to show you. It's called the REST CRUD API based on step functions, workflows, and API gateway. So here, what I'm doing is instead of a Lambda function or three Lambda functions, I have a workflow. I route all requests from that API gateway endpoint to my step functions workflow, and the first task is to decide which branch to run, whether that's get, put, post, or patch. Then that runs the SDK directly on DynamoDB. So there's no compute being used here. If I go back to this example, there's actually no compute here. All I'm doing is reshaping a request and doing something on a database, right? I'm not calculating anything. So I shouldn't need to use Lambda, which is a compute service, if I'm not really running any compute. So here I'm running the SDK directly. 
There's no invocation cost for Lambda. There's no cold start time. It's just as cost effective and just as performant. And it's much easier to understand what this application's doing. Now, the reason I show you that is because we kind of arrived on that, uh, that workflow through our own experience, if you like. We created this application called Serval Espresso, which was here last year in the Expo Hall. And it was an application that lets you order a cup of coffee from your mobile phone. Um, and it was built entirely on serverless technologies. And one of the microservices in this application was called the Order Manager Service. And it was this very kind of simple uh, CRUD REST API that used API Gateway to Lambda to DynamoDB, much like the example I showed you before. We had some issues with it, right? We ran this for the first ever time in 2020 at uh, AWS reInvent, where we had 60,000 uh, customers. And there were some latency issues. There were some kind of buggy code issues. We had a flickering issue with the screen because of it. And we were trying to debug this in production because we'd never run it at that sort of scale before. And we found it was really difficult to find the individual line of code that was causing this error. We got through the event, and we rebuilt the whole thing as a workflow for all the reasons that I've just explained. Easy debugging, better observability, less latency. And this is how the order manager service looks today on that particular application that now runs sometimes at five different events around the world at the same time, and it's much more reliable and resilient, we think. We chose to run that as an express workflow. And that's what I want to focus on next, right? There's two different modes for running your step functions workflow on AWS. You have a standard and you have express. And it's really important that you choose the right mode. Since step functions was first released, it's kind of had a, a reputation for being expensive. And kind of in, uh, in response to this, I think 2019, the step functions team launched something called express workflows, which are more cost-effective, shorter duration type of workflow. They've launched many other features as well since then, but what we found is that people were either unaware of this launch or didn't really know how to use it, and so they still think step functions is expensive, whereas it's more a case of understanding how to use the features to optimize, right? And that's what I want to just quickly show you. So standard workflows can run for up to one year, long-lasting. This is unusual for serverless applications to have something that can run for so long. They're asynchronous. So if you trigger a standard workflow, you won't get the response. You'll just get the acknowledgment that it's been triggered. You'll have to retrieve that response by some other call. And they have this exactly once execution model. So if you invoke a standard workflow with a given input payload, you can be sure there will be no duplicate invocations. Then we've got express workflows, which have a much higher throughput. So they transition through those states much more quickly, single digit milliseconds in some cases. They have a totally different billing model. I'll explain that in a moment. They have an at least once execution. So there is a chance that you'll get a duplicate invocation with a given payload. So you have to make your steps in that workflow idempotent, which means no matter how many times you run it with that given input, you'll always get the same result. Now, these can be run synchronously. Okay, So that means you can invoke your express workflow and get the response back. And that's because they have a maximum duration of five minutes. So it's much shorter, one year versus five minutes. So here's an example of an e-commerce workflow that I built using step functions. And this is based on a real uh, customer that's doing something like this. And it does kind of simple things, high-level stuff here, like uh, an SQS queue, putting something on an SQS queue to notify that an order is ready, polling a DynamoDB table to check that the order is approved, uh, publishing a topic processing a payment, and then checking the payments being received, and then a bunch of Lambda functions that update order history uh, and inventory and so on. It's kind of a high-level implementation. Now, I ran this a 1,000 times as a standard workflow, and then a 1,000 times as an express workflow to show you the results. So I'm comparing some things with uh, real data. Now, the first point is that the standard workflow took a little bit longer to complete. It's not very interesting, you know, half a second more. OK, we probably would expect that, but that's not the bit I want to focus on. This is the important piece, right? The standard workflow costs 42 
cents for a thousand executions, but the express workflow costs one cent. It's exactly the same workflow definition, exactly the same code, doing exactly the same thing, but just run in a different mode, express versus standard. And I'll show you why, right? Standard workflow billing is based on the number of state transitions in your workflow. So that's when the, the execution passes from one step to the next, that's a state transition. And you'll build $0.025 for 1,000 state transitions. So to work out the cost, you take the kind of average number of state transitions in your 1,000 executions, which in this case is 17. I run it 1,000 times, so I times that by 0.025, and that's how I get my 42 cents. For my express workflow, it's different. You're based on the number of times you run the workflow and how long that workflow takes to complete. It doesn't matter how many transitions or how many steps there are in that workflow, right? So that's the execution cost plus the duration cost times by the number of requests. Now, the duration cost itself is broken down into the execution duration to the nearest 100 milliseconds times by the memory cost. So every time your workflow runs, we allocate a certain amount of in, uh, in memory megabytes, goes up in 64 megabyte increments, and you can find out what this value is after you run it. For this workflow, it's this number here. So I add that to my overall uh, execution cost, and that's how I get the 0.01 uh, dollar. Now, a typical application like this wouldn't run a thousand times. It will run hundreds of thousands or even millions of times, right? So when you extrapolate this out and send a million requests to it, the difference starts to become really clear, right? I should definitely be running this as an express workflow. And this is really important for developers to think, especially when you're building applications in the cloud, because everything you do, especially when it's serverless, it has an implementation uh, against the cost, right? So you have to constantly be thinking about how can I optimize this particular workload if it's going to be serverless and get all those benefits that serverless gets you, you have to watch out for the best way to build it. So why would you ever choose to build something as a standard workflow if it's going to cost so much more? Well, there are times that you'll have to, right? If it takes more than five minutes to complete, for example, then you can't run that as an express workflow. Or if you require the exactly once execution model. But you have options. If you need either of those two things, what you can actually do is merge both together. So this is the next pattern I want to show you. It's called the nester. And here I have a parent standard workflow that calls, at some point, a kind of child express workflow, gets the response from that child express, and then it continues running. Um, Let's imagine that this little polling sequence here does take more than five minutes. Maybe there's a human approval step involved and they're not at their desk or something. So in this case, I would have to run this as a standard workflow, right? So here's what I do. I take those idempotent lambda functions, I strip them out, I save them as an express workflow, and then I just call them from my parent standard workflow. And to work out the cost of that, you just add the cost of the two together. Now, my parent workflow now has 14 state transitions and not 17, so that costs just 30 cents. My child workflow is absolutely tiny. It doesn't even affect the overall cost. So now I have this workflow that can still run for up to one year, and it costs 30 cents instead of 42 cents, just by stripping that out and running it as an express workflow. So the key thing to know when you're building with step functions is if it's a standard workflow, you want to reduce the number of steps in that workflow. If it's an express workflow, you want to reduce the overall definition and the input payload so you have less memory that you need to use when you're running it. But that cost is only the cost of the orchestration piece, right? That's only the cost of pulling these together in step functions. You still pay a cost for all those other services that you're running. So here's an example of a simple workflow. First of all, I get an item from DynamoDB. Now, that takes up read capacity units. There's a cost associated with that. Then I have my first state transition. Then I invoke a Lambda function. There's a cost associated with that, separate to my step function's cost. Then I have another state transition, and then I put something onto an event bus. And again, there's a cost associated with that. So another way to kind of optimize for cost is to reduce the uh, reliance on other services, right? 
And step functions has this thing built in called intrinsic functions. And these allow you to perform simple little manipulations, simple transformations without having to use a lambda function, for example. So things like manipulating arrays, working with JSON data, uh, creating a, new, a unique ID, simple math operations. And it would be like this. So let's say before you use an intrinsic function and you had to chunk an array up into four pieces, you might use a lambda function and run a bunch of code like this and then return those four chunked arrays. But if you use an intrinsic function, you can take that lambda function out and simply run this states.array partition. So then you're not incurring the cost of invoking your lambda function. If you wanted to split an array, well, you would probably use a lambda function, and then you'd have to run some code like this, or you could just use the intrinsic for um, merging data together, merging two uh, JSON uh, objects together, sorry. This was one that was really heavily requested, which was generating a unique ID. You had to use a lambda function for that, where you might even need to pull in a library in order to do it. Now you can just use this intrinsic to generate your own unique ID. So the whole point of using an intrinsic function is that you don't incur any invocation delays of things like lambda cold start times. You don't incur any costs for things like running a lambda uh, function. And there's no code to manage because it's built directly into your step functions workflow now. Another thing. So here, I have a, a loop, right? And here I have another one, because this is an asynchronous a uh, little mini workload here. I'm doing something, I'm waiting a certain amount of time, and I'm checking if that's done. And this is a, a common kind of challenge with anything that you build asynchronously, is that you need at some point to understand when that workload is finished, right? Um, probably the easiest way to figure out when that's finished is by polling. And this is a super easy thing to implement. I know that because my six-year-old's really good at this. I live in the south coast of England, OK? Not far from France, I thought. And I chose to take my six-year-old on a boat to France for one day and back. And when we got to the boat from New Haven to Dieppe, the first thing she asked me is, Daddy, how long is this going to take? I thought, oh, I haven't actually thought about that. I asked someone, and they said, four hours. So I said, four hours, great. 10 minutes later, Daddy, how much longer is it going to take? Every 10 minutes, she's polling me for status updates about our journey. Really effective, works really well, but really annoying, really chatty. And it's the same with your step functions workflow. I'm such a boring dad that immediately I thought about step functions. Yeah, I need to think about that, actually. Um, because what you're doing here is you're going around this loop. And every time you go around this loop, you incur three state transitions. And that costs you money, right? A better way of doing this is a callback mechanism where she would ask me, Daddy, you let me know when we get there. And when we get there, I say, OK, well, let's look at our phones, and I'll let you know. And we arrive, and I say, we're there, and we can have a happy day together. And you can implement that in step functions as well. I'm going to show you this next pattern, because it's a better one, which is the emit and wait. If you're not building serverless applications, if you're not running workloads in the cloud, this is the pattern to take away with you. This is the thing that you can drop into anything you're already doing to orchestrate something, OK? It's called the emit and wait. And what this does is it uses choreography and orchestration together to uh, control a sequence of events. So anything where you have a kind of uh, conveyor belt of operations that you need to carry out, that you need to organize, this is the pattern you use. The first thing it does is it puts an event for the most important, the first milestone. We call it milestone one. It drops an event for milestone one onto this event bus. And then that will, in theory, trigger off some other microservice. Now, that could be something that's on-premise, something you're already running. It could be a Lambda function. It could be something in another account. Doesn't matter for this example. But that, that does whatever milestone one needs to do. What it also does is it drops a unique task token onto that event bus. You catch that task token, and you throw it into storage somewhere, for example, a DynamoDB table. Now, when whatever needs to do milestone one has finished doing milestone one, you send a request back into your, uh, your, your uh, workflow to say, OK, grab that task token and give it back to step functions and tell it to continue. And then step functions will jump to the next step, and the pattern continues with milestone two. So you can orchestrate anything in this way, right? And it will wait for up to one year for each milestone to finish. Let's say you didn't want to wait a year, though. Let's say you only had 20 seconds, and then you need to react 
based on that? Well, of course, you can set that with a timeout or with a heartbeat where your application will just wait that specific amount of time, and then it will catch that when it times out, and you can get, take a different branch and react accordingly. That's the emit and wait workflow. I put that back into my e-commerce workflow, which means I can strip away these two polling loops completely and replace that with this wait for task token model. I won't go through this in lots of detail, but the key thing to know is that now I've got just eight state transitions. So the overall cost of this parent-child workflow has now dropped to 20 cents per thousand executions. And this still runs for up to one year, right? So I've gone from 42 to 20 cents just by implementing some kind of simple functionality. And I haven't even added intrinsics to this yet. I won't show that again. We'll move on to some other stuff. This is Dr. Werner Vogels. He's the CTO of Amazon. I believe he's Dutch, actually. Um, he's well known as having said, everything fails all the time. And step functions and workflows in general are great for managing failures, great for capturing and reacting to failures. Probably the, the best known pattern for workflows is this saga pattern, where you can use this sort of built-in error handling to roll back a sequence of events. So let's say I've built a holiday booking system where I book a hotel, I book a flight, I book a car, and the happy path is like this. But let's say the booking of the hotel cancels or fails, well, I can capture that failure and roll it back. If that passes, but then a uh, customer chooses to cancel or the booking of the flight fails, well, I can capture that and then roll back sequentially. So you have this nice kind of elegant waterfall pattern of sequential rollbacks. Another interesting one that you can implement is called the circuit breaker. So here, what I do is I um, prevent retrying some downstream service when I know my application is broken somehow. So I maintain the overall status of my circuit, we'll call it. Uh, I'm going to maintain that in DynamoDB. And then the first thing I do every time is I check, is my circuit open or closed? What's the health of my application like? And if it's closed, I go ahead and run that downstream service, and I exit. Then the next request comes in, is it open or closed? I go ahead and run it because it's closed, and then something fails. I capture that failure, I open the circuit so that the next request knows that there's a problem. And then the next request comes in, it knows that it's open, it doesn't run that downstream service, and I can start to escalate that. That's the circuit breaker pattern with step functions workflows. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that step functions lets you run at tremendous scale, right? And there's, there's whole uh, talks all about this, so I'm trying to condense this down into the specifics, okay? The main thing to know is that step functions let you do lots of parallel invocations. And these are independent threads or independent workflows. So if one of these breaks or fails, it doesn't affect the other workflows that are running. They're, they're totally um, unaware of each other, if you like. Now, you have this thing called the parallel state, which allows you to execute a fixed number of branch with a given input. And that same input is given to every branch within the parallel state. So in this example, it's a user ID. So I give the user ID one, and then I look up the zip code, I look up the phone number. And then when both of those things is finished, that gets added as an output array to the final state. If one of those errors, then the whole thing errors out. So again, I have to capture that error. So it's all about building workflows where, where you capture those errors and you react to them accordingly to make your applications more resilient. This is where it gets interesting, though. This is dynamic parallelism. So this is essentially a workflow within a workflow. I hand to this dynamic state an array of items, and I can execute these three steps within that uh, parallel state all at the same time. Okay. So here's an example of where we've done that, or an example of the fan-out pattern, which you see in all sorts of different uh, architectural uh, blog posts. This is the fan-out pattern as a workflow. And we built this for a website called Serverless Land, which is a really great resource, by the way, if you're building out serverless applications, where we, the first thing we wanted to do when we built this site is to aggregate all the AWS blog posts into one central location. So we built this workflow that populates the site. And the first thing it does is it scans an RSS feed to get all the new blog posts on that day. It saves them into an array, and it sends that array to this dynamic map state. 
The dynamic map state then, all at the same time, depending on how many new blog posts there were, will scrape that blog post for metadata, generate an object that looks like this, that has things like the title and the author of that post, and then it will save that information to GitHub, which is where we keep the code base for this static web application. When each one of the blog posts uh, metadata has been grabbed, it will trigger a new build of the application, and that gets pushed out. We actually improved this by using the fan in, fan out, or the scatter gather pattern. So what we did here was move that save to GitHub step outside of the dynamic uh, parallelism state. So what that means is we send to this final save to GitHub one array of all the new blog posts, and we save that in one go. So what we've done there is we've reduced the number of state transitions straight away just by moving that out of our, uh, um, our dynamic parallelism workflow. Now, that will only do a concurrency of up to 40 items at the same time. So what customers were doing, they were embedding parallel map states within parallel map states within parallel map states. And it's quite a clever way of creating like really uh, dynamic, concurrent applications. But it became quite difficult to track when things went wrong, quite difficult to debug. So we launched something six months ago called the distributed map state. So what this does is it allows you to run that dynamic map state as what we call a distributed mode, and it gives you up to 10,000 parallel executions. So we've gone from a concurrency of 40 to 10,000 just by updating something. Now, this plays really nicely with S3, which is an object store. And what you can do is you can point it at an S3 bucket and say, run these, uh, these next steps concurrently for every item in this S3 bucket. Or you can point it at an object, and you say, run it concurrently for every uh, row in this CSV file. Here's an example of uh, something I built to kind of show this off. So this is a serverless GIF generator. So if you imagine you have an application where you want to timeline scrub across an MP4 file, what this does is it creates a five-minute GIF a five-second GIF animation for every five-second window of an MP4 file and lets you kind of scrub across that timeline. So it's triggered when you save that MP4 file to S3, and then it runs this workflow. The first thing it does is it uses FFmpeg to say, OK, if this is a, an MP4 file and I need to create a bunch of GIF animations, where will the start and the end be for each one of these GIFs? And it generates an array to figure that out for each GIF animation. It saves that array to S3, and then it invokes and enters this distributed map state where it spins up a Lambda function that will uh, go ahead and build each individual GIF animation and then finally save that back to S3. Why am I showing you that? What's interesting about that? The interesting piece is that it doesn't matter if the MP4 that I upload is 10 hours or 10 minutes. It will take the same amount of time to complete because I'm spinning up a Lambda um, invocation for each individual GIF animation, 10,000 at a time. So that's the interesting bit, right? That's how I'm able to get this incredible parallelism by using this distributed map state and Lambda together. If you want to learn more about building applications with workflows, this is a really good resource. It's called uh, s12d.com slash workflows. And here you have well over 100 uh, examples from customers. It's all um, from the community, really, where they've built workflows and they've, uh, they've added it to this resource. You can search by use case. You can search by services. Um, and you can deploy that directly into your account. You can uh, explore it visually. You can look at the infrastructure as code template that they all have. They have uh, Terraform, SAM, CloudFormation, and the CDK. You can even inspect the ASL syntax, the definition of your workflow, which is great for helping you debug any issues. And with this button here, you can actually deploy that straight into your AWS account. So here's that final link again that has all of those resources together on one page. So deployable uh, templates, blog posts, videos, workshops, and code samples. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer that. And thank you very much.